Well, good morning, Nicole. So wonderful to have you on the Essence of Transformation. Thank you, Kaylin, <laughs> for inviting me. And it's been wonderful to be inspired by your work, by your beautiful book about your father, your memoir. Thank you. Horse to Holyoke, who was an immigrant from Germany. Yep. And I loved how it was written because I felt that I was moving through his life with him. Nice, nice. I really did. I saw it as a very visual experience, like going through a movie. Yeah, I think that's a lot to do with his storytelling style, which was part of the editing process because he recorded stories of his childhood in Germany during the war and after the war. And I transcribed them, and there was a temptation to kind of tidy it up and make it sound a little smoother, but I wanted it to have his sort of cadence and the way he speaks, which is very much uh, English as a second language learner and peculiarities that are very him to me. So I wanted to really capture his voice. And you did. I mean, you really, really did. I felt like after, if I ever met him in person, I feel like what was expressed in the book is who he is and that he'd be very much the same way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I'm glad that came across. Yeah. And even with his early childhood history, which had a great deal of trauma in it. For sure. He, the way that you wrote it and the way he expressed it, which I admire so much, is Nobody, the reader does not have to be drawn into the drama of the dynamics of it. So you don't have to re-experience any kind of um, trauma. You don't have to. It's yeah, very good. historical. The way yes. you wrote it, it's very like going through a history that has so many facts. And then you figure out later on how you feel it shaped his identity, his role as a father, his his discipline regarding being a provider. And that's the stuff that for me really resonated with such significance. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I mean, you know, it's hard to, um, you know, imagine a different experience, but I grew up with parents who were immigrants and who were refugees during the war, and we didn't have a lot of money. We grew up in Holyoke. I'm the firstborn child. So I really absorbed a lot of that storytelling, and they were still processing it. So I heard stories all the time about when we didn't have food and when we had to beg and when we were working at 10 years old and things like that. So that had a huge impact on me my whole life and how I thought about what I wanted to do with my life. Well, I love that because when I first met you, that was very much a part of your, your identity. You were, you've always been drawing comparisons between yourself and others, which I felt was enormously humanitarian. Thank and, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And your instincts are profoundly compassionate regarding people's individuality and their stories. Yours as well, Kay Olin. You are, <laughs> you know, you have that natural kind of empathy and understanding of people and what they've been through. So thank yeah. you. Now, in addition to that, you self-published. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which to me is absolutely fascinating. Right. Um, this was kind of like a one-off book. I do have some other writing projects, and I've always been a writer. Yes. But when I thought, like, this, my father asked me to do this as a favor. So he said all, all his life he's been telling his stories, and people have said, you should write a book. But he's not a writer. He's, you know, got, yes. you know, he, what language would he write it in? He's not accustomed to writing He's a machinist. Yes, <laughs> he yes, can build exactly, things. You know, exactly. That's not his natural way to be. But his storytelling when he recorded the stories was very uh, charming in that he said it by seasons and talked about like daily life, what it was like growing up in Pomerania and then when, you know, living through the war and stuff. Yes. Um, so I think he actually has a little bit of a creative 
artistic storyteller side to him, which wasn't something I really thought about growing up. He was just very stern sure. and hardworking. And yeah, sure, sure. And that's another aspect of the work that I really appreciate, because I think that very often men are seen in very stereotypical ways within the family. Mm hmm. And they have a very particular role to play. And I'm not going to get involved in the wide variety of the ways in which one plays that role. But one of the things that was very charming about the book is how naturally he enjoyed being a parent. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I really love that. And it really comes out. It's very, it's, it's very poignant. Um, and in my own history and in my own experience of men in different capacities, many of them end up extremely bitter and they resented being a father, frankly, or having too <clears throat> many children. It was overwhelming. He was not overwhelmed. Yeah, I guess in general, um, Yes, I didn't see it. You yes, know, he didn't yes. behave in a way where I would have described him. Which as is lovely. Yeah. Which is stunning to me. That's really stunning. Yeah. So I also see the memoir as evidence of such total acceptance, which of course would have to do something to do with his childhood mm -hmm. and the ways in which he experienced historically all the trauma that was way beyond him. Yeah, But part of the beauty of him is that he remained extremely high-functioning, that he did not allow it to discredit him. He did not allow it to, to reshape him. He, he seemed to take things very matter-of-factly. And again, that would be having something to do with the, the people in his life, his family, and how they coped. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, and I think that's one of the biggest lessons that I learned from him um, so, you know, sometimes you're, you're living your childhood and everything's normal and then there's a war and then exactly. you're fleeing an area. It, he didn't go back until, you know, the, the wall came down and, yes. um, you know, so it's coming to a new country and everything he did, it was just a, well, you, whatever happens, you have to make the best of it and yes. keep moving forward, keep having adventures and yeah, very clearly, yes. very clearly. And I thoroughly enjoyed, I enjoyed that very much. It made it a very smooth book. Yeah, to thank read. you. And the self publishing part, it's kind of funny. I mean, part of it was I just didn't want to um, spend the energy trying to find a publisher. I didn't know that I needed to bring anybody into the project. Mm -hmm. And then some of the mistakes, like the first run, there were some spelling mistakes. And my mother caught them, which is brilliant because that's <laughs> like how she would be. And, but I remember showing my father and saying, is, you know, I, transcribed your recording is this how this is spelled and he's like yeah and I could have thought to fact check it you know I could have easily google translated it but yes. I'm just like well if he said it's right it's right yes. but then I'm like my father doesn't care about spelling <laughs> I should have like had the wherewithal to realize that and <laughs> double check it but I don't really care and that's a little bit um the imperfections of the book are exactly sort of what was right to capture because when he told a story, sometimes he'd tell the versions a little bit differently. And I'd be like, should I fact check whether this happened in 1945, whether there was bombing here? Yes. Do I need to look this up? Yes. And I'm like, no, this is an 80 year old man's recordings. This is what he remembers. This is how he has formed these stories. And that was what was important to me. So. But it also comes through so clearly that I appreciated it so much. Yeah, yeah, that's nice to hear. Thank you very yeah, much. I really did. So I want to move on a little bit to the discipline involved, just for a moment, Yeah. as a writer, because it takes so much dedication. And of course, I have a book out, I'm yeah. an author, um, and I know that when you're trying to to define other people's reality or their sense of reality. Yes, true. That's a very, um, a very introspective kind of an, an assignment, you know, and, and you, and you, I know you, cause you are especially careful not to put words in people's mouths, not to over identify with them. 
You have a very strong independent identity like your father does. You do have that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It is. Yeah, I agree, though. It is <laughs> tricky, though, with language. And like one yes. of the things we talked about, like a transformation of growing older, yeah. that I use the word old to describe myself in one occasion when I was working at UMass. And an, uh, another woman who was in the conference room kind of hissed at me a little bit and said, you're not old. And I'm like, ah, interesting. Yeah. Now I'm going to use that word all the time. <laughs> because to me, I'm like, it felt like an honorific. I've reached 50 and now I'm 60 and I'm looking forward to calling myself old. And I love being old, but other people don't want you to use that word. They want you to use a euphemism and you're middle-aged or you're yes. a youthful, mature person. But I'm like, no, I'm an old person. Like, yeah. Why can't I pick the word I want to use to describe myself? Exactly. Yeah. And that's a really good point because there's so much pressure uh, on women, of course, because of pop culture. Yeah, right. And to apologize for being old or apologize. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. When in fact, the alternatives are less than desirable. Yeah, yes, right. <laughs> you know, I made if, it to old. I didn't know don't, that I would. Not everybody does. I mean, you don't. It's you heartbreaking, don't. you know, so, yeah. And I know that when I was... As I was coming up, one of my attitudes was, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. Therefore, I will take this particular risk and do this particular thing. Yes. And yes. I will dedicate myself to its outcome, whether it ends up being a favorable one or not, was less significant than going through the process of the commitment right? Yes, absolutely. Sure. I can tell from your experience, because we've known each other for a while. Sure. So we've talked about a lot of different things. But a fearlessness of absolutely. if I try to make all my decisions to appear a certain way or to come across a certain way, where are you going to end up? You're going to you won't even know yourself. And better to try to be like, this is what I'm doing. However, it works out. It's it's knowledge for me. I'm learning something. And that's what I'm here for. And always the pressure for women. In fact, we can look, even look at the campaign going on about Vice President Kamala Harris. There's an enormous emphasis on her appearance. Yep, yep. What I admire about her is her endurance. Her schedule is outrageous to be, and also courage to be, constantly filmed in front of so many people and be around so many people in these days, not only since COVID, but because of the the level of violence in this country that's so outrageous. So mm -hmm. she's been amazing, but I'm also really turned off by the media as they completely put the accent on her appearance, whether or not she's attractive. <laughs> she was just on the cover of Vogue. And it's like, what lengths does a woman have to go to? <laughs> and we've lived it. You've lived it and I have. Yeah, like, it's yeah. not surprising. <laughs> no, it's not yeah, surprising. Yes. It's and I try to avoid a lot of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, a dialogue that's trying to make people very afraid because that's how they can control them. So, yes. Um, I mean, I certainly keep up on I the agree. news in different ways, but I'm I less agree. drawn to a uh, corporate news kind sure, of sure, sure. format. But yeah. sure. Um, now, so another thing is um, regarding your education. Yeah. You are a staunch believer in education as far as I'm concerned, because you did it and you did it when you were slightly older. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Correct. Yeah. So tell us about your education and how you, why you gravitated toward it and what kind of significance it's had to this day, as far as you're concerned. Interesting. Mm. Um, I, I feel like I've always been smart and curious and that I liked that about myself, but I've always... Um, kind of not liked school um, much. And particularly by the time I got to high school, I hated school and I never thought I would go to college because I'm like, I'm just trying to survive high school. 
Um, I actually waged a campaign to allow my parents to let me quit at 16, but they would not. Um, <laughs> so that's fine. Mm -hmm. But then after a while, it's like I was just working retail, which was fine, living my life, doing, you know, whatever. And I said, well, I'm going to want more. I'm not I I'm, I need something more challenging. So I went to Holyoke Community College and I paid cash for my first semester. I'm like, prove to me that this is worth my money and that it's interesting. And I loved it. I mean, I love, Good. you know, learning and um, kind of being pushed to look at different disciplines and different things that I might not have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of kept with it and then transferred to UMass and later got a master's degree. So, yeah. Yeah, I just and also, um, you know, people would say I, went, I was an English major for my undergrad, like, oh, you'll never be able to do anything with that. I'm like, I'm not there for the end result like that. I'm here yes. to yes. learn and experience, be exposed to things, connect with people. And I just want to spend my time and energy. It's my money. It's my time. Exactly. On things that yeah. I'm interested in, yes. you know, and if it were strictly for a career or something, then I would have just wanted to pay for a training school. And this is how you become uh, <laughs> yep. whatever. You yes, know, so. yes. Yeah. 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 And also the process of being educated is quite an experience. It's really requires so much time and so much commitment. I find when I went to school, um, I was about 40, 43 when I went back to college and got my degree. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was working full time elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. And life doesn't stop for you while you're getting an education. <laughs> yes, I always worked through school. Yep, mm -hmm. either a full-time job when I was at um, Holyoke Community College and going part-time. And then even when I worked at UMass, I had a part-time job and, you know, tried to, you know, make things work out that way. And I had started Holyoke Community College also yeah. when I first came here from New York. And they were wonderful. Yeah, I had. They I mean, that's wonderful. really why I continued. If I would have yes. had a bad experience there, I probably would have just said, "Forget it." But that's yes, it such was, a I good was point. very happy at Holyoke. Yeah, yes. that's such a good point. And I had gotten um, a certification in early childhood education there, and then I also transferred to UMass at Amherst. Yeah, yeah. So it's been quite a journey. I've also gone back and lectured at UMass several times. And I'm very grateful, like you mentioned, had it not been a good experience, you would not have gone on. Yeah. And that was so for me as well. Yep. Because here I was with students who were younger than my own children were at the time. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, and from a feminine perspective, from a female perspective, that was quite an experience uh, as a parent and, and a so-called almost middle-aged woman, not quite, but almost. Yeah. <laughs> and the relevance of chronology in terms of discussing women and their lives is really fascinating. The age element <clears throat> yeah. being so significant to people. And like you said, um, that women are afraid of aging. They're afraid of it. I think there are a couple of reasons to be. Number one, it, it always reminds you of your mortality. So that's a challenge to deal with right there. But more of it has to do with being attractive or unattractive, being desirable. Or not. And that was always disappointing to me that the sexual politics of aging for a woman was so intrusive, so invasive, and so judgmental. I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> but... For me, being a young woman was so much harder because everybody knew what you had to do, what you were doing wrong, how you should look. Mm. You know, you you yes. need to have long hair. Men like long hair. You need to do this. You need to look <laughs> like that. You have to, you know, or if you looked at fashion magazines, there'd be a page with like don'ts and you like you know blacked out yes, pictures that's like hysterical. if you if your legs are like this don't wear this kind of pants I'm like I need pants you know I'm a, I don't care what I look like I I gotta get out of the house that is so funny and so and, true what and, a memory just brought I mean, back so many memories right. one, one of the gifts of being older is that I'm invisible I can time travel. And I can say whatever I want now. But when I was younger, I felt a lot more pressure to appear a certain way, to comply.
by, to make other people comfortable, yes, to yeah. always be thinking about those things. And now I'm like, I don't care, you know, so <laughs> it's kind of nice. It is. Um, so I wanted to move on to your, well, one thing I definitely want to discuss with you is the impact of COVID on you and on your careers. And you have your own business. So I want us to definitely discuss your business. Fo, if you don't mind telling us something about it, how it began, what is it exactly? Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, essentially, like, I've always loved the idea, and I've worked for some owner-operated businesses, like 25 Central and Thorns Marketplace, sure. working for Paul and Cherie, and, you know, when I was younger, too, um, working some places. Uh, and I liked the idea of being completely in charge and being accountable and someone knowing that if there's a problem, they can walk into the store and talk to the owner. Like, I like that. Like, yes. I'm making the decisions. I'm here where bigger corporate kinds of things seem so uh, diffused and like, oh, you can look at the website and find out where you could send an email to who knows where that person is or something like that. Yes. Um, so we always liked the idea. And when Jim and I, my partner, my spouse, were living in Baltimore and working and having a nice life, um, we talked about opening a little restaurant. And we would just kind of, you know, as we walked around, like, oh, what about a space like this? And how would we do it? And we always kind of liked thinking about those things. Um, but then we kind of got practical about it. And we're like, neither one of us really has any kind of <laughs> restaurant experience. We don't know. Can we really do that? And we had started collecting vinyl figures, kaiju, safubi, different kind of art stuff that we were interested in. And then one day Jim said, well, maybe we should just open an art gallery. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's start thinking about it. And um, part of the reason was, you know, we had secure jobs, good income, you know, there was an easy sort of path where you could see yourself moving up at the company and doing whatever. Um, but once we knew we weren't going to have children, um, cause I had cancer and, um, that's, you know, been I've successfully, it's been many years and I had ovarian cancer, but, um, then we felt like we could take on more risk. So, had I gotten pregnant, I'm sure I would have just stayed where I was working because I had great benefits, good income, yes. lots of opportunities to move up. But all of a sudden, it's like, well, you and I like to do more daring and interesting things. And if it's just you and me and that I'm not trying to think about what somebody else needs, then we can kind of do something like this. So the idea was just let's do it for a year or two and see what we learn. Like, let's just be open and not have a real we had a clear idea about how we wanted to be, but I'm like, what if you start and something else is what people really want to come for and see, mm -hmm. then we wanted to be able to shift and change as we needed to. So, I mean, now we have an online store and it's a much smaller part of our life at the moment, but it's still there. We still do it. Like just, we woke up this morning and we had an order. We're like, oh, when we get home, nice. we have to ship this, <laughs> you know, no big deal. But, um, but we think we, you know, we've done some pop-up spaces, pop-up events in Baltimore at Atomic Books. Um, so I've had art in a show there. Jim had a piece, you know, a piece in a show many years ago, um, when they had Atomic Pop and they were focusing on that kind of, uh, vinyl figure collectible culture um so yeah so we've been interested in it for a long time and well, that's then we wonderful. just yeah. figured you know we want to do something fun and see what we learn now how can people uh where do they go to learn more yeah, about if this they and want... also about your book as well by yeah, the way sure. oh yeah sure um well the website is shop s-h-o-p fo f-o-e dot com so Great. you can go there it's not so active now, but you can see what we have. And the book is for sale there, but you could okay, also great. Google it and get it through Wonderful. someone else or whatever. <laughs> okay, beautiful. I wanted to ask you about COVID specifically. Yeah, all right. I'm, I'm curious about how, when first, and also I do want to ask you one other thing that's important, very important right now. What would you say is one of the moments of transformation in your life that has been the most relevant and has resonated 
um, throughout throughout your adulthood, pretty much. Is there any particular moment that was particularly transformative for you? Hmm. <clears throat> let, let me think yes. on that. Mm -hmm. Um. Not so much, mm -hmm. I guess. It was, I always felt a little bit uh, out of tune with my peers and people would talk about what they wanted or what their plans were. And it was not how I thought of life. When I was younger, it seemed like what was expressed was, well, you just don't know. You're naive and you'll soon discover that we're right. We're keep telling you what you should do. But <laughs> yes. now that I'm older, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've really always been like this. Yes. <laughs> and the fact that I kind of tried to tr stay true to myself and making the decisions that felt right for me. I didn't want to make them out of fear. Um, yeah. You know, I yes. think I find myself in a place where I'm doing the things that feel right to me. And so I feel comfortable and that's where I wanted to be. So, well, I I, it sounds very transformative to me. The decision making to be oneself. Yeah, right. It's right. a very powerful, impactful decision. And it's a hard decision. People do not want you to be yourself, you know? <laughs> yes. People want you to be in that same, I mean, all kinds of things just growing up. I happen to be tall and people would be say, well, you have to find a partner who's two inches taller than you, <laughs> two years older than you. Be otherwise, you know, and all these like rules sure. of what needed to happen. I'm like, I've seen tall women with short dudes like that's it's not impossible <laughs> like, yeah. you know whatever like why just seems silly to me to put those kinds of things first you know uh yeah superficial things yeah well I think that's a really interesting point I know that when I was coming up I was um always warned I, I kept getting warned. Well, yes yes <laughs> and um and fear there was yes. people injected so much anxiety yeah. in, in my own independence or individuality. There'd be so many concerns. And I found it quite confusing. I really did. Yeah. And I wondered why. And we're talking about people in general. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's part of, I do think it's a very maternal quality. Because it would always be very emotive from, from women. With men, it's much more intellectual. It's more cerebral. It's, well, well, if you do this, then you'll do that. Well, should you do that? Maybe you shouldn't because of that. But with women, it'd be, well, I really care about you. I really think you're making a mistake. Aren't you a little bit afraid? Oh, that takes a great deal of courage. Yes. And there's all this underlying anxiety. True. And I think it's a very interesting part of compassion and kindness and giving but it also is a strong implication that these people have carried a great deal of regret with them about their own decisions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how I think it was, I, like you, I think it was well-intentioned when yes. somebody might have said, like, if I said, oh, I'm, whatever, I'm quitting my job, I'm going to do this. <laughs> oh, do you think that's a good idea? What if you don't find another job? Exactly, or, I'm exactly. Like, I'm like, I, well, I'm not worried. Well, you should be worried. I'm like, maybe, <laughs> but, yeah. um, but yes, I think it, I think it was meant well, but, um, yes, I think it said more about their own fears yes. and like, I would not make the decision that you're making, you know? So, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So even though it's well-intentioned and I think it's something for us to be aware of in ourselves regarding other people Yeah, and also, being older women, when we're speaking to younger people, yeah. you know, don't inject our fears onto their lives. Let them be. Yeah. Let yeah. them be and find out and do who they are. Yep. Let them be who they are. Because the really critical moments in life are going to be, they're not going to escape anybody anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yep. One's going to have to be reflective. One will have to make different decisions. This is all part of human nature. Yes. Yeah. And so I found that for myself, the that element of fear right. was really difficult for me to take in from about 19 to 24. Yeah, yeah. Because I thought, well, aren't we all human beings? Aren't we all going to go through things? I mean, I observed older people going through stuff. I watched 45 and 50 and 60-year-old people go through stuff yeah. that they're unprepared for. 
that they must accept, that they must cope with one way or another, um, or possibly make the decision they will not cope and then do what one does when they no longer cope. Yep. Um, so in that respect, we're all experiencing these transformative moments of identity where we're choosing. Yes. We're yep. choosing not to give in to fear pressure. We're choosing not to be afraid. It's a choice. Yeah. Yeah. I um, A few years back, probably right before COVID, I had lunch with a woman I know in Baltimore, a lovely person. And I mentioned, just as it came up in conversation, that I failed English my senior year in high school. And I ended up staying to get my high school diploma and just working and whatever. And I wasn't sure I was going to go to college. And her question was like, weren't you afraid to get out of step with your peers? And I'm like, my only goal was to be out of step with my peers. Yes, yes, <laughs> so yes. from my perspective, yeah. I was like, yeah. I'm trying to get off that train. Like, I don't yes. want to be like, you know, compare, like now we're all graduating at the same time. Now we're all getting married at the same time and buying our suburban houses at the same time. I'm yes, like, yes. I never had that vision. Had I fallen in love with someone and that was my life? Sure. But I, it was not like a goal or a way I wanted to see my life. I wanted to see it sort of like you mentioned with my father, like an adventure. Oh, this happened? Well, I'll pivot and do this. Yes. And I don't have a job? All right, I'll find something else. You know, yes, like, yes, yes. I'll just figure it out. So. Yes, yes, exactly. And I think there's an element of freedom in that. Yeah, it is. That you chose, yes. that you needed and yeah. that you expressed and you chose it again and again. Yeah. That's that's what I feel like I'm trying to do in life all the time is yes. eke out those you really only get those moments where you feel free. They're so infrequent because there's always something to do. Got to go to work, got to do the laundry, whatever. There's always something. And when you can just be like relaxed and feel free, I'm like, I'm going to try and get those moments <laughs> as much as I can, you know, as long as I have. I love those moments. Yes. Right. I love them. Right. And they are enormously creative. And I find that they keep generating a kind of activity and inspiration and decisiveness in life. Yeah, yeah. So I think the benefits are enormous. Yes, yeah. So I wanted to ask you, how did you get through the COVID experience? Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, how, so there's two questions here. How did you get through that experience? How did you cope with isolation or insulation? And then when it was time to come out of it, because I find everyone I speak to has had that insular experience with COVID, first yep. of all. Yep. And then also the beginning to get out, the beginning to speak to people, the beginning of more communication, the beginning of newer relationships that may or may not continue because a lot of us are going through post-traumatic stress from it. And I found that period myself fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> and challenging. <clears throat> yep. Um, it was, it, it was interesting. We happened to, uh, we ended up moving back to Baltimore because my husband accepted a position and I stayed here and wrapped things up and then joined him. And he just had rented an apartment and I was looking for work and we were going to wait to like look for a place to buy, I guess. And then I just was kind of looking at the market um, just to see what houses were. I'm like, why don't we just start looking and see what we find. And we bought a house or, you know, we have a mortgage. We don't yes. own the house, but, you know. Of course, uh, yes. And because sometimes people are like, oh, you own your house. I'm like, well, well you know, <laughs> I mean, the bank owns it. But, yes, yes. Um, but it happened in like the fall of 2019. And I'm glad now because we had that place and it was so perfect for that time. So it's three floors, just a small row house. But um, Jim and I were both working from home and both in school. So it was pretty much that he was on one floor on his computer for 14 hours a day and I was on another yes, floor. Yes. So it was like there was so much work to do. You almost didn't have time to be thinking about covid and what was going on because it was like 
well, I teach all day and now I'm going to my classes in the evening yes. and uh, all online. And that was all new and Zoom fatigue, you know, looking yes. at my face for 14 hours a day or something. <laughs> just like, good Lord. Yeah. Um, but it was more like we were just in this maintenance mode. Like, this is what has to get done. I got a homework assignment due Friday. Let me get that done. And I have to write a lesson plan. Let me get this done. Um, and one of the nice things that we had, which was strange, and I didn't know it would be so beautiful for us, but we have a rooftop deck, <laughs> which sounds fancy, but we're really not very fancy. And it was like walking up those steps and then just sitting up there. It's so beautiful. I can see the harbor. You can see the water. Suddenly it was like, the world isn't falling apart. It's beautiful. And I just would have this oh, nice. like peacefulness Good. of like, you know, this can help yes. me to just kind of be calm in this crazy time. Um, but as far as like going back out, it just all seemed so weird and awkward, yes. you know, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like I'm going into bars. There's all these beers on a list I never heard of. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, it was something I used to know how to do, like grab a beer. I'm like suddenly like, do I need help with That's this? Can, you know, <laughs> Jim, please order me a That's beer. Funny. I'm nervous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm like, just pick something I like. But it, so it was a little bit more overwhelming suddenly yeah. being around people and, you know, yes. but yeah, I don't know. Just yeah. figure it out. Mm -hmm. But. I found it interesting in terms of, for me, it was a very uh, inspired and creative time because I'm a photographer and the photography just increased and increased. So once I got out and walked, I was totally at peace. Yeah, right, right. Really yes, at peace. You can, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I was at Smith College when they cleared the campus because of COVID. Yeah. I was on the campus there just doing the walking that I do. Yep. And all of a sudden, and I thought maybe a bomb went off. I thought maybe we were at war. Yep. Because literally everyone started leaving the campus. So something clearly had happened. And I'm not a big news person. I don't, I'm not plugged into the news. Yep. And especially on those walks, I'm not. So I didn't know what was happening. So I went off campus and then I went home and I learned this pandemic. So interesting it, that it happened like that yep yeah it was quite interesting it was very dramatic right right where you're like huh <laughs> i don't know what, <laughs> what is happened? going on yeah i really some thought weird energy and yeah totally. people are leaving yep and people were panicked yep like they weren't just leaving comfortably casually leaving yes no they were leaving so okay so i said okay huge change and then somebody i knew stopped by and they said things will never be the same so that was my next introduction to whatever happened. Meanwhile, I had no idea what happened. Yep. And nothing, nothing happened, you know, to me. Nothing happened to my family that I was aware of. Right. Okay. So then I'm thinking more, wow, globally, this is big. This is huge. Whatever's happened. And then gradually I found out what had happened. Yep. All right. So the inconvenience of it, it, it totally... It totally wiped out what I was doing regarding a, an additional stream of income, for mm -hmm. one thing. Yeah. So there were enormous sacrifices that were going to be made that were involuntary right away. Yes, yeah. So for myself, I considered that a gigantic transformation that was yeah. completely involuntary. Yes, yeah. And it was going to impact everything. It was going to impact how I think, what I believe in, how I feel, whether I cope, how people around me that I care about are coping, whether or not they are coping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, of course, that isolation meant a total disruption of communication. Yep. And plus, people are organically involved. They're organically affected by a loss of job. They're organically affected yeah, by not yeah. being able to, to leave their home. Yes. By living with someone they may not even want to be living with anymore. And yet they're going to be with that person for quite some time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a little early COVID <laughs> joke of like, uh, you know, whatever, something you see on the internet or something. Yes. But someone's like, uh, you know, because a, a couple, you know, it used to be Jim and I went to different jobs and we wouldn't see each other all day. But suddenly it's like, you know, why is this spoon here? <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like <laughs> suddenly we're in this like so space true. where I'm like, why is that there? And he's like, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't even know why I'm asking. But I'm like, but it's, just yeah. so used to, like, who who would do this? And, Precisely. You know, and you, you did have to kind of adjust to that. But, yeah. Yes, yeah. definitely. I yeah. mean, I certainly had to. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then also, 
the fear aspect and people dying, the mortality yeah, aspect of yeah. it. So it was a radical, radical departure from what I expected or what I would have hoped for. Yeah. All right. Now, then afterwards, during the process of adaptation and the absurdity of the information on the air, <laughs> which is beyond belief, which would be another show or series of shows, then beginning to go out, beginning to communicate with others and for us trying to form new relationships. You know, because everybody's upset. <laughs> Plus the wars. Like, what do you talk about? You know what I mean? What's, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. That was also really interesting because I feel like the time spent at home that I would normally be doing be very productive with and very creative about was definitely also deeply affected by deep trauma and an enormous woundedness. So I feel like any wound that I had already experienced in life from a childhood definitely, definitely got tapped in on again. Yeah. A deep sense of insecurity, let's say, yep. about the future. That my life was not in my hands anymore. Right, right, yeah. I mean, you know, if you have to get a shot, you have to get a vaccine or else. Yes, then yes. Then you're going to get the vaccine or else. Maybe. Not everybody, but many. Yeah. Yep. And then if you're going to die from this, it had never occurred to me how many ways there are to die. Right, How right. many things to die from. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's not even funny. It's yeah, just Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But it's absurd. It's yep. absurd. Yep. And then where did it come from? And what is this? Yep. And nobody really knew, or those who knew did not say they knew. So there was that element of secrecy. Oh, it's just this thing that happened. Well, that's highly unlikely. So for me, when I stepped out and I began to re-communicate with people or begin to store, form new relationships, <clears throat> I found the communication was really stunted. And the expectation of some people was that you'd want to hear everything. Hi. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, we just met. Okay, yeah, let's go for coffee. And then, blum, you know, blurting out anything, the person. Right, right. So I found that social dynamics were really, really blurred because. <laughs> so people's just kind of normal conversational skills was were gone. very, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. They were, <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. It was like starting in the middle. Yep. But when you're in the middle of something with people, you've already made decisions to continue to know them. Yep. But there had been no decision making to know. Yeah. And so the boundaries that we were raised and trained with in this culture through all kinds of forms of therapeutic interventions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they were gone. Yeah. That was gone. Yep. There weren't boundaries. And then the decisions had to be made differently. Well, do I really want to go out and hear about all this again? And how do I tell somebody who is obviously traumatized? I'm so sorry, but please don't tell me about this part of your life. <laughs> yes, I, I, right. That's I just, so tricky. Yes, right? because also, I'm also re I'm also uncovering, discovering, and recovering. Also, yes, it's a process, and I don't care to share all that. Yeah. I'm not going to match you. Yeah, on yeah. these things. So it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you you've said so many interesting things that my brain is like going in eight directions. But like there is sometimes that sort of um uh trauma comparing, you know, like yes. oh, this happened to you, well this happened to me and it's worse or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. I'm like, no, people are hurt. <laughs> people are hurt. People are hurt. And yes. um but one thing that was, is interesting, like right now I work with some younger women and we talk about these times and what we've been through. And most of them, you know, they're in their 20s or something. And um, one thing I thought was interesting, because you'd ask a question about intuition and yes. whether or not you trust it and how you think about that. So I asked these women just to kind of see how they felt about it. And they each mentioned like, being, you know, anxiety and like being yes. anxious yes. about something and, you know, how, how you navigate the world. And I thought, I'm sure I also was anxious uh, when I was in my 20s, but it was absolutely not a language that 
anyone spoke. When I was out with my friends, nobody was like, oh, I'm feeling a little anxious. <laughs> it was like you had to oh, pretend so you knew so it or, it or more like a nihilistic thing. Like, <laughs> I'm so just going to, you yes. know, I'm just trying to get through today. Get me a beer. <laughs> like, let me listen to some music and forget about all this stuff. But it was something that like wasn't admitted. And I think that now people are able to talk about that a little bit yes. more. But yes, yes. But also, like you yes. said, sometimes it becomes like where someone is just giving you too much and like telling you too much. And you're like, what what can I do with all this? I, yeah. Like, you, you know, you don't want everything to turn into a therapy session. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just want to have coffee yeah. and talk about what you just do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went for a walk yeah. and people look at me, oh, how boring. That's it. And I go, yeah, yeah, that's kind of it, you know, yeah. but I feel kind of good. Yes, I feel good. right. I <laughs> love walking. Yeah. <laughs> and then I went home and I did my thing and it was great. And, and yeah. then it was great. How could it be great? Right. We're right. in the middle of, you know. Right. Right. Well, yes. If you choose to point out something positive and someone's <laughs> not in the mood for it, they're you know? mad at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You know, but I'm, I re speaking of like walking or something <laughs> or how boring I can remember I used to when I was younger, I, I ran more and I, I would sometimes, you know, people are like, oh, do you exercise? Well, I'm like, yeah, so I, I run. I like going to the reservoir running and people are like running is so boring. I'm like, well, you know, I bring my brain. <laughs> I'm like processing things. I'm thinking about my day. I'm thinking about something I'm working on. So to me, it's kind of a meditative thing where I can focus on my breathing and pacing and then also just have my mind on something else and I kind of like that being out in nature and stuff like that but but yes if you're a person who loves like a I don't know you know some kind of class with an instructor saying you know a dance class or something which I could never do because I'm not coordinated like <laughs> then it might seem like going for a jog seems really boring <laughs> <laughs> It felt different. You know, but it's very funny. So after a while, I'd say, please, uh, let's chat. But I'd like it to be from um, almost censoring somebody. Please don't let it be before 1995. Nothing that happened to you before. <laughs> because, again, it, people would go back, you know, you know what happened to me? And I go, no. And I think they're going to tell me something current because yes, we just yes. met. And they tell me, like, okay, all right, okay. Um <laughs> Yeah, I'm so sorry. And I am. You are sorry. What else? Yes. I'm very sorry. Yep. So then, um, and then, so it was kind of interesting to be moving and developing along those lines with people. I was wondering about, um, and also learning to be more careful myself. Because, you know, I'm also that person who will go, hey, you know, whatever, you know, and talk. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And um, as you can see, which is one reason why I have this program, but and other people can be more reticent to be so spontaneous and open in the moment about things. But the other part of it is that we all went through something totally horrifying and, and people have been mourning. I know people who got sick and died during that. And yet the whole mourning process was taken away from you because you couldn't even be in the environment, yes. which, let alone travel. I mean, it's <clears throat> absolutely devastating what we've all gone through. But one of the reasons why I decided to do the program, The Essence of Transformation, is to open up communication in a certain platform where we can discuss more of the details about that, about approaching trauma with somebody you barely know, as if you're not expressing trauma that 10 or 15 years ago would have been completely safeguarded and only shared with people you knew really well. Yeah. And that was just another part of this, which fascinated me. Yep. Regarding culture and communication. Yep. Yep. Well, you asked me earlier about like a transformative moment, and there have been so many because really, if you're trying to pay attention to your life, I mean... Everything yes. is is changing sure. and transforming you. Absolutely. But as a young person, there were some things that I was taught at home of how you should be in the world. And I would approach the world in that way. Yes. And then when you found out that that was not going to happen, like an early job when I was in my 20s, there was a abusive boss owner. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, a lot of 
the woman I worked with, we complained about it. And I said, you know, maybe he doesn't realize I'm going to go talk to him because I was naive, I guess. Yes. And when I went in to talk to him in his office and I said, hey, you know, blah, 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 whatever I suggested. And he just pretty much stared at me. And then I started crying. Yes. Not, not like bawling, but tears coming yes. out of my eyes because yeah. of the frustration of here I'm coming in good faith, trying to do the responsible thing and say how this is making us feel. And I hadn't considered that someone could just block me and be like, who gives a shit? Yes. You know, yes. so suddenly I'm like, oh, my mother told me that <laughs> if I have a problem with someone, I should try to really approach them and, you know, explain myself. Yes. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, sometimes people and then but that's yes. when I said, anytime I'm doing this again, I'm never, ever going to cry again because now I'm prepared for that. So yes. after that, when I had to deal with something that I didn't want to uncomfortable, very stressful, you know, uh, fighting a bully, dealing with some issue at work, I was like, I could handle it because I already knew like what I might face. And then I could kind exactly. of exactly decide ahead of time how I was going to handle that but it just hadn't even really occurred to me that like because my mom and dad are telling me like hey you know maybe it's a misunderstanding why don't you try and go fix it first you know I'm like oh no this person just is yeah. trying to control me and I just hadn't hadn't realized that yet but yeah yeah and that's a very good point I mean that's a very those are one of those moments yeah, where, you're like, <laughs> where they're oh. really so interior and there's so much to really think about about yes. it because you want to change behavior. Yeah. You don't want to set yourself up. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then with that comes those additional skills that yeah. become so handy. Yes. In yeah. life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to just ask you to <clears throat> repeat, please, where people can buy your book. Um, the book is Horse to Holyoke. Yes. And you can find it on my website, yes. shopfo.com. Um, or, you know, I don't know, Barnes and Noble or whatever good. else, you know, bigger, you know, online you order it. That's good. Um Yeah. yeah Great. That's it. And also about Fo, if you don't mind repeating how they can find out more about Fo. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you go to the, you can follow um Fo Gallery on Instagram. Is that what it's I'm trying to think. Sometimes I don't remember. Sure. Jim's running that one. Um, but um, yeah, you, if you go to the website, all the links are there. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can look there and get in touch with us that way or follow us on Instagram. Excellent. You know. I think that's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. I really yeah. appreciate yeah, it. Sure, sure. Now, I also want to, I'm going to ask you three questions that are totally ridiculous and silly and unrelated. Okay. All right. <laughs> 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 what was your favorite song when you were a teenager? A teenager? <laughs> that's a big span. It's a bit. Well, let's make it. Uh, let's I, say I, we can say what's your favorite song, but I would like something that was somewhat from the past. From the, yes. Well, I will. I, I have okay. an answer because a song popped Great. into my head instantly. Great. But my favorite song when I was a child was the girl from Ipanema. I was obsessed yes. with that song. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love it still to this day, which is something I think is interesting that, oh, you can love something at six and still be just as excited <laughs> to hear it when you're 60. You yes. Know? But part of it was, I mean, the rhythm and the singing and um, and then also sort of the semantics of it. There's some kind of clumsy language, but I'm used to that because my parents are, you know, English language learners. Yeah. And there were always stupid mistakes in our house that were hilarious. Oh. <laughs> um, but the song starts with tall and tan and young and lovely. And I'm like, oh, it was the first time I thought of tall as something desirable because it was always something I was embarrassed by. Yeah, you know, I, I was 5'10 yes. at 13 and taller than every boy and all my teachers and the principal. Yes, and yes, so yes. I'm like, oh, tall might be nice. And so I just kind of like this beachy kind of vibe <laughs> so but I just think it's interesting that like something that appeals to you when you're young is something that yes still I hear it now and I'm like oh I love this song so yeah one of mine was in the jungle the mighty jungle oh, yes, the lion right? sleeps tonight and yeah. here I am a Leo and yeah. our and our animal See, is lion oh, right, right so I, it resonated so right, deeply right right and I have another question for you what okay. was your what's your favorite color pink Okay, pink. 
Another question is, what's your favorite movie? Oh, my God. I have an answer <laughs> because this is the kind of thing you have in all kinds of icebreakers in class and stuff like or you <laughs> fill out something. And I'm like, I have an answer that I say just because it's an easy answer to give, because sometimes favorites bother me because how can you pick one favorite? Yes. So I always say Jaws. Oh, just yes. because okay. I'm always willing to talk about That's that movie. fascinating. <laughs> but it's also <laughs> just, it's a short word. It's an easy word. Yes. I'm happy to talk about Jaws anytime somebody feels <laughs> like it. But it's not really my favorite. I watch all kinds of things. And, you know, you can love different things for different reasons. Just like book recommendations. Well, what I would recommend yes, for you yes, is yes. different than what I'd recommend for a friend or something. So yes. I like to be much more personalized well, about I those things. That. So there isn't like the one thing you know but, that's great I love but that. yeah so that's the answer that i give cool. i have a few uh you know very someone cool. asked me um this is what i'll say because i guess i always felt a little bit like if you try to pick something too obscure then i'm like trying to say i'm very arty and <laughs> strange or something <laughs> or if you pick something classic or so sometimes answers just seem like they you know that's interesting yeah i anyway. like that that's yeah. the the rebellious, very, very independent, very autonomous Nicole Shea speaking. <laughs> the don't mess with Nicole from Holyoke. Oh, yeah. Identity don't issues. Don't go there. Sometimes very, I no. overthink things and it's like, you know, uh, <laughs> like if you have to introduce yourself and then they'll say like tell us one interesting thing about yourself and i'm like good lord like what do you mean because you either have to choose to brag a little bit or and i'm always like I, what am i gonna say and then i'm overthinking it then i'm listening to other people's answers <laughs> so now i usually just say i'm hilarious <laughs> and a kind of deadpan you know so i'm like i don't know i just have a go-to answer that i See, use that's like jaws <laughs> okay there's the writer in you as far as i'm concerned because only Maybe. writers come up with these yeah variety of how to interpret something how someone's perceiving it you know it's all part of that artist and writer um personality i have uh, my i think mine was city of angels Mm -hmm. I find myself gravitating back to that with Meg Ryan and okay. um, Nicolas Cage. All right. <clears throat> I liked it because it dealt with esoteric issues, celestial issues, issues of uh, mortality, love. And, and it was done in an entertaining fashion. It wasn't done where you were knocked over the head with it. Yep. Okay. So you didn't have to walk away with it believing in anything. And I liked that it was done that particular way. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I do have another question for you. And my question is, how do you perceive your future? We will give it, say, in the next three years. What can you imagine for yourself that you would like? Um, yeah. Uh, I like not knowing. So I really never try to have a very formal plan but I am trying to write more and think about what my next writing project will be. I've kind of got a few where I've been compiling things and I don't know which one I should kind of move to the forefront. But we've also had a shift in our lives because my husband just um, passed the bar and he's going to be a lawyer. So he's going to look into different kind of work. So yes, I feel like our lives are going to change in some ways that I don't really know yet. Yes. And a lot of it is finances, you know? Yes, so it's like yes. sometimes we were looking at a studio space for faux in Baltimore so that we could have events, but at a kind of not in the like open every single day life that yes. we had here, which yes. was just not sustainable. I'm like, well, I can do it, but you sort of get used to that abuse. You know, I'm like, am I really going to work 70 exactly. hours a week and yes. never have a day off for forever? I mean, five years is enough, you know? Yes, yes, so, yes. So then COVID happened. So that kind of got put on hold. And yes. so we might revisit those kinds of things. But yeah, writing okay. and just adjusting, you know, to Very whatever cool. happens. Very cool. And I want to thank you for coming today. It's thank so beautiful to have me. you. It's so nice to be asked and to be in conversation with you. All of these wonderful facts of your life that you shared with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Thanks. <laughs> and your wonderful gift as a writer and having written this memoir, which is lovely, which I'm really continually recommending to people. 
Right. And thank you for being a beta reader on it, which is also an interesting process because you asked about like self-publication. But I had four or five people read the book in advance and give me feedback. And even that is not a, a you know, I got great advice from everybody, but one person might have said, this is really important. This is the key. And someone else is like, "Do you? are you sure you want to include this? Mm -hmm. So it's like you're never actually going to produce this product that's done and final yes, and perfect yes. for everyone. So you just kind of have to like, yeah, I like to do it in, in a punk rock way where it's like, yeah, it's not perfect. There's spelling mistakes. Yep, that's wrong. Okay, keep going. Do the next thing. Fix it, you know. But that's really the key. That's yeah. really the key is self-acceptance. Yeah, yeah. As an artist. Yes. As a writer. Yep. Um, as a photographer. Yeah. Self-acceptance is key. Yes, I agree. And yeah. I've known a lot of people in a variety of fields. I'm from New York. I was in the You've done art so industry, many, singing, yes, the politics, yep. the arts, you name it. And one of the worst things people can do is see things differently than that, frankly, because it becomes very self-defeating and very self-destructive. Yeah. And that's one reason why I'm here and I'm in the position that I'm in right now is because I agree with you. I agree. You absolutely be yourself. Life is, is not a perfect experience. It is full of imperfections. There's no reason for you to... To try to be perfect. Yeah. Set your goal. Accomplish what you hope to accomplish. Get your skills together. Get the discipline together. Allow yourself to remain inspired. This is what I get from you. Allow yourself to be independent. Do not take other people's baggage with you. Do not do it. Yeah. Do I get the same it. from you. Yes. And because there is this sort of... Uh, very polished and, you know, uh, you know, Instagram influencer or me corporate media kind of way that people are, are used to. They feel like, well, everything has to look like that or my yes. book has to be perfect or yes. I can't do it. I'm like, if you're waiting for perfect, it's never going to happen. Just put your work out there. Do it. Put it out there. Keep growing and learning. And if your perfection is... Um, that's it's hiding. It's you know it's stopping you. So. And the process is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely pretty. So I'm going to close the show now with one of the quotes that I use, which is, "When you are younger, you reach out to time. When you are older, time reaches out to you." I consider both an embrace. I would not go back one minute, one day, one decade. When you are discouraged, simply rethink your plan. Take a minute and reconsider your perception of self. Most all of us are raised to be hypercritical of ourselves. Most all of us are told what to be and how to be it. As Nicole expressed so clearly in this show, Many people have very clear expectations of behavior, of work, of outcomes. Be yourself. Do your thing. Enjoy it. Enjoy your life. Love your life. And so I want to thank you, Nicole, for coming. I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bravo for your comments. I thank agree. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs>